healthy nutrition uh, during this challenging time. Welcome, Mathia. Okay. Hi, I'm Mathia Ford, registered dietitian, licensed dietitian, and I have um, been working as a registered dietitian for over 22 years, and I have over 15 books about kidney disease on Amazon that you can find. I have a website, renaldiethq.com, and um, I've been working specifically with kidney disease for the last um, probably six or seven years, and I've learned a great deal about kidney disease. But as a dietitian today, I want to talk to you about the diet for chronic kidney disease. So there's a couple different um, stages for kidney disease that you might have that is, has a little bit different diet. So there's pre-dialysis before you start um, dialysis, CKD stage three, stage four, where you're gonna focus on eating a variety of foods, still eating a healthy diet, but having a lower protein and a lower sodium intake and watching potassium and phosphorus if necessary. So when I say if necessary, what I really mean is if your doctor has told you that your elevated levels of blood in your blood are potassium or phosphorus and you need to reduce those. A lot of times when people get diagnosed with kidney disease, they'll be given a list of foods that is high in potassium and they think that's what they need to restrict. And that is kind of the old thinking. Whereas the current um, research evidence base is that you need to eat lower protein, lower sodium, and then if you have elevated potassium, then you should try to limit those higher potassium foods. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about potassium and phosphorus in a minute, but I want you to be aware that your main job when you have pre-dialysis is to manage your related conditions, eat a variety of food, and eat a little bit lower protein and sodium, and I'm gonna get into exactly what that amount is in a minute. If you have dialysis, if you're on dialysis, a lot of times you're going to a center, you may have a few different, there's a few different types of dialysis. There's in-center, there's home dialysis, there's peritoneal dialysis. All of those can make a little bit different um, nutritional needs, but in general, it's gonna be a higher protein amount. You're still gonna have limited sodium. You're probably gonna be limited on the amount of fluid you can take in, and you're probably gonna have potassium and phosphorus limitations dictated by your doctor or your nephrologist. They're gonna tell you how much you can have. And then if you're post-transplant, um, after you've had a transplant, a lot of the limitations are lifted because you have that working kidney, but usually related more to the medications, you have a um, tendency to have maybe some diabetic complications. So you may want to um, manage your uh, carbohydrate intake at that time. So the renal diet is really about getting quality protein just not too much protein. And then if you have micronutrient deficiencies or um, elevations, what happens is over time with your kidneys, they are less able to process those um, different types of micronutrients. So they tend to build up in your bloodstream, which means then you have to manage how you uh, take them in. But for the most part, you start with sodium, which helps with blood pressure and um, lowering your protein. Protein in your body is um, like a waste product in your body. Um, once we use it for all those different hormones and um, nutrients in our body, building, building cells, our body takes um, what's left over from that and makes a waste product and our kidneys take that out of our blood. What happens when your kidneys have reduced functionality is they're not able to remove that as easily. So let me get into some of the specifics of the diet. When you're talking about protein, one of the things for hemodialysis um, or peritoneal dialysis is that you need a higher amount of a higher quality protein, which is usually 1.2 1 to 1.3 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. So here in the US, we tend to weigh by pounds. In the UK, you may weigh by kilos or stones. Whatever it takes to convert that, um, in the United States, one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds of body weight. So I do easy math. So 220 pound person would be 100 kilos and they would need 120 to 130 grams of protein per day if they were on dialysis. Now I have a notation here to make about half of your protein daily uh, from high biological value protein. Those are animal products, um, 
They can be eggs, they can be meat, fish. Um, and if you're vegan or vegetarian, you just wanna to try to make sure you're getting higher quality uh, beans, legumes, nuts, those types of things. But um, if you're not vegetarian, then you just wanna make sure that you're getting the best um, high quality protein. You don't wanna, you don't wanna get um, all of your protein from like grains because those aren't necessarily complete and gonna give you all the amino acids that you need. So you wanna make sure that you're getting that complete um, healthy high biological value protein. Just means that your body can digest that easily. CKD stage three and four, which is pre-dialysis. Um, I want to encourage you that you should not eliminate all proteins to try to slow down your progression to end stage renal disease. It is a limited diet. It does have less protein, but your body needs that protein as building blocks of cells and hormones. And it does a lot of other things with your body. And you're actually putting yourself in a worse um, nutritional stage, nutritional condition as you progress to kidney disease, as you pro progress to dialysis, if you're uh, nutrient depleted by not having enough protein. I've had patients tell me that their doctors told them to eat only vegetables and fruit. And honestly, that's very poor advice. You need to make sure you're getting the minimum amount of protein that you need. And that amount with chronic kidney disease pre-dialysis is the lower amount of 0.6 to 0.75 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. So same 100 kilogram person, pre-dialysis, they're gonna need um, 60 to 75 grams of protein per kilogram per day. Um, so you may be wondering how much is a gram of protein? And what I would tell you is that in general, um, one egg or one ounce of meat or fish contains seven grams of protein. Um, one cup of milk contains seven grams of protein. So if you're allowed 70 grams per day, that would be 10 ounces of meat. Now you do get meat from, you do get protein intake from other products. So again, grains, some fruits, um, some different um, beans, legumes, milk, so you're gonna to try to get about half of your protein that you need. So if you had 75 grams of protein that you needed, about half of that you're gonna to try to get from actual protein products. And then the rest, you're probably gonna get from different um, nutrients in your diet. Phosphorus. So again, ensure um, you are talking to your doctor. If they tell you to limit phosphorus, they're typically gonna give you some sort of phosphorus binder um, but for hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, it's expected that you're going to be limited to do about 800 to 1,000 milligrams per day. I get both cases, I tell you, phosphorus levels in the blood are difficult to control with your diet. You need to take your prescribed binders with meals for them to work. So if your doctor has prescribed you Tums or another type of binder, you need to take them with the meals. What they're doing is binding to that phosphorus in the food and keeping an inner digest digestive tract. So by eating them with meals, then you're allowing them to work most efficiently. If you take them too far ahead or too far after, they're not gonna do their binding properly. And then the other thing I wanna encourage you to do is make sure you're getting a full session of dialysis. Make sure you're staying for the full amount of time or if you're doing it every day, make sure you're allowing it to work through that full process. Um, the first part of the dialysis process removes a lot of waste product, but then as it kind of goes a little bit longer, that's when you're able to get more of that phosphorus and other um, high elevated levels out of your bloodstream. And then for stage three and stage four and beyond, um, you would limit it if you were told by your doctor to limit it. But the important thing to know is that when you decrease your protein intake, say uh, you know you decrease down to the 60 grams per day, protein kind of comes with phosphorus. They're kind of married together. Um, so when you decrease your protein intake, then you're um, decreasing your amount of phosphorus just naturally. So it's typically is not a need to restrict until you get really close to stage five. Um, and again, phosphorus levels in the blood are difficult to control with just diet alone. So if you have elevated levels, typically you're going to need to take a binder. Um, so potassium, 
Potassium is a huge one because everybody wants to start with this one and really start with protein and sodium. If I can say that one more time, I will start with protein and sodium. Do not start with potassium. Potassium should only be restricted if your labs show that you're elevated for hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, typically um, based on labs. And if they have high levels, then 2,400 milligrams or less per day. Um, you need to ask your doctor at all times, you know, are there medications that might affect this? There are certain medications, diuretics, blood pressure medicines, that might affect your potassium levels. So you need to ask your doctor as you see your potassium level elevating, if it's getting close to that edge, ask them, are there medications that are gonna affect that level? And if so, is there a better choice that doesn't affect this? Because um, there are different choices, but that's definitely a discussion you should have with your doctor. And don't restrict your labs unless you have high potassium. I mean, don't restrict your potassium unless your labs show they're high. So healthy eating. Um, a lot of people tell me when they get put on this diet that all of a sudden all the healthy eating that they've been told to do goes out the window. And I used to agree with them, but actually with these new guidelines, you still should eat a variety of healthy foods, uh, fruits and vegetables for as long as you can and not restrict the main things, again, sodium and potassium. So I wanna talk, I mean, sodium and protein, sorry about that. So, so I wanna go through some thoughts related to this um, home you know, isolation that we're doing. And a lot of people might be using a lot of canned foods or non-perishables. So one of the, some tips that I have for you there are to look for the lower sodium options. And if you don't get a low sodium option, rinse canned vegetables and that will lower the sodium. So you pour out the liquid and then you rinse them off and you um, use fresh water with that, that'll lower the sodium significantly. Eat a variety of fruits and vegetables. So try to get green and yellow and red, all those different colors. If you're eating a uh, canned fruit, make sure that it's packed in 100% juice or um, a light syrup. You don't want the heavy syrup that's very sugary. You can make your own broth for a lower sodium option. And later on, I'm gonna tell you that you can cook a whole chicken and then peel all the meat off of it. Sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit. But you can use that um, bone, that carcass of the chicken to make chicken broth that is excellent for you to use to make some soups. Um, using dry pasta or rice in meals to extend the portion without adding more protein. Dry pasta and rice have like uh, three grams of protein per serving versus meat having seven grams of protein per ounce. So if you want to make uh, more volume in your meal, which when I grew up, my grandmother, my mother did this, you put more pasta or more rice in that. So you have the volume of the food on the plate or when you eat, you feel fuller, but you're not adding that protein. And then beans can be a good source of low fat and high fiber protein. Um, and you do absorb less phosphorus from beans. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, but um, it's really important to know that you can use beans and mix them with some meat maybe and get some good, healthy, uh, more fiber and um, still get your protein that you need. So let's talk about labels for a minute. This picture is highlighting the difference in sodium intake and that's why it's important to get the reduced sodium type um, canned foods, but Read the labels for added phosphorus and in the new ingredients section of the label, what you're going to see is the word PHOS and that'll be part of another word, sodium monophosphate, phosphoric acid. Those indicate added phosphorus. So that's the kind of phosphorus you want to avoid. You want to know, you should know that you absorb about 50% of the phosphorus from plants. So people tell me all the time that beans are high in phosphorus or avocados are high in phosphorus. And the whole thing about those is you're only absorbing about 50% of that naturally occurring phosphorus. It's just not available for our bodies to absorb. When you eat animal products, you're absorbing about 75% of the phosphorus that's in those. So remember I said meat comes with phosphorus kind of naturally. You absorb about 75% of the available um, phosphorus in that food. But when you eat foods that have added phosphorus, um, that are added to uh, do all different kinds of things um, to make them flavor better, to make them last longer, whatever, you absorb 90 to 95% of that phosphorus in the food. So what I want to encourage you to do 
is to read that label, especially on canned foods, and when you're making a choice, choose the one that does not have those phosphorus um, ingredients in there. So if you have two cans of um, canned corn, for example, which I don't think is gonna have a lot of phosphorus, but you look at one and you look at the other, you read the ingredients, one has that phos, one does not, pick the one without. Phosphorus is not listed on labels, but it is um, easy enough to kind of see that added phosphorus amount and to just avoid that in general and that'll make you healthier. Uh, something else I want to highlight here, you can typically have a little bit of everything, um, a little bit of what you want, but probably not a huge amount. You may have to choose it less often. You may have to choose a smaller portion, but you can still have a little bit of that. So I'm really big on not getting rid of all the food that you want to eat, but to try to manage it within your diet by eating a, a more appropriate amount of it. Thinking ahead, so if you have someone who is coming to your help, house to help you cook or who's helping you prep meals or you get tired and um, you know you need some help, uh, you would like some things that you can cook ahead. One thing, so these are some of the foods that I cook ahead to save time and to make it easy to grab and put together. So rice, you can batch cook rice and put it in the fridge. It'll last three or four days, goes in a lot of different meals. You can batch cook beans, um, you can take dry beans, soak them, you can cook them for, um, you, you know, using over a period of time, adding them a little here and there. You can roast vegetables, keep them in your fridge for three or four days and then just warm them up when it's time. And I personally like the taste of roasted vegetables more than boiled or you know cooked type things. So I like the roasting process. So you can roast some ahead. Um, for your sweet tooth, you can make some muffins or cupcakes, obviously cupcakes without the added frosting and cookies. You can batch those. You can freeze them in single portions and then take them out when you're ready to eat them. If you like to have a brand muffin for breakfast, make them ahead keep them and make it at one a day at breakfast. Hard boiled eggs. You can make hard boiled eggs ahead of time and they're great to put on salads or um, to make some egg, egg salad sandwiches, that type of thing, or just to eat in general. They're very good thing to have cooked and they're quick to eat and they can kind of give you a little bit of fullness. They are protein though. Meatballs, you can make up meatballs ahead of time, cook them, and then you have almost like a portion control. So if you know you need three ounces and you have one ounce meatballs, you can have those um, ready to go and to cook through four with your meal and you're controlling the amount of protein you're getting and you also make it easier to make kind of a meal. You can cook soups and stews ahead of time. You can cook a whole chicken. You can roast a whole chicken or get a rotisserie chicken and then take all the meat off the bones and all that meat you can chop up and you can use to make sandwiches. You can put them on salads. And then again, take those bones and make yourself some broth. Hamburger meat is also a great thing to um, cook ahead and kind of have available to put on, um, make some tacos, make some different kinds of, um, you know, put it on your spaghetti, that type of thing. So those are some ideas. I wanna go through a few little freezer tips. Um, so you don't wanna freeze eggs or salad like lettuce. You don't want to freeze egg-based sauces or dairy or raw potatoes. Um, so the first few, they actually separate and kind of taste yucky. Raw potatoes just have too much liquid in them, so they don't taste very good if you unfreeze them. Um, you should freeze foods immediately if you're not going to use them in the next two to three days. So when you're having leftovers or if you're making something and you have leftovers and you know you're not going to eat it in the next couple days, you should immediately package it and freeze it and mark um, right names and dates on the food when you freeze them. So uh, a lot of food looks very similar when you're um, cooking it or when you're getting it out of the freezer. So it's important to know the date that you put it in there and the name of what it was. And um, again, with the meats, you should remove them from the store packaging and repackage them, put them in a bag and um, instead of freezing them in the store packaging. For liquids like soups, if you want to freeze some soups ahead, then it's a good idea to lay them flat when you freeze them, and then you can stand them on the side to store them so you can kind of stack up almost like a little bookcase. So just don't let them freeze in kind of a big puddle. It's so much easier if they're flat, and then they defrost much easier too. Pack your freezer. 
your refrigerator is more efficient when you kind of have the room for the airflow, but your freezer is more efficient when it's full, when it has more stuff packed in there because that cold just helps it stay colder. And then um, I want to tell you kind of a little bit about freezing, refreezing. So you should not refreeze certain foods at certain stages. So if you have a raw food and you, and you froze it and then you thaw it, you need to cook it again before you freeze it. So your raw foods, then you cook it and then you don't eat all of it, then you freeze it. And then the next time you thaw it to eat it, you should either eat it or discard it. You should not refreeze it. Those are just kind of food safety things. <coughs> mm, excuse me. So some items to always kind of have in your house um, that are make it easy to put together some dishes. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about um, some dishes you can put together. But pasta, easy to use in a variety of dishes. Angel, angel hair noodles, spaghetti noodles, egg noodles, just regular noodles. They work in casseroles. They work in lots of different soups. Uh, you have rice. It's easy to store, quick and inexpensive. You can keep tuna or chicken packed in water. Um, they make quick meals and it's easy to eat hot or cold. And it can store longer because it's usually canned. And eggs, eggs are quick meals, making omelets, poached eggs, fried eggs, pancakes, all different kinds of things. You, sh you could always have canned beans and legumes because they work in lots of recipes. You can also have dried, but dried just tend to take a little longer. So if you're looking for something quick, you can use some canned beans. Canned vegetables, low sodium, or do the process like I told you before with rinsing them. You have frozen vegetables. Um, they can save a lot of time in cooking and they're usually low in sodium because they're kind of frozen at the point of use. They actually can have more nutrients than fresh sometimes because they're frozen at the point of uh, purchase or point of uh, harvest. And then you're able to, it saves a lot of that nutrient in there right away. Always have fresh fruits and vegetables. Whatever's in season is gonna be lower in cost and lower sodium because they're fresh. So easy to use and have in your house. And then potatoes, you can make a variety of meals and side dishes. If you're not watching your potassium, you can eat um, you know, potatoes. I would mix it up with, with noodles and rice, but you can have those as part of your uh, schedule. So I wanna go over a few simple recipes that just to remind you that a lot of recipes are just things to put together kind of in a um, order. So a salad is really just lettuce, romaine or iceberg, and then you put a little cheese, you can put some fruit, you can put fresh or canned vegetables, you can put nuts, you put that protein. So that chicken that you peeled off the whole chicken that you cooked or rotisserie, you can dice it up, you can put it on a um, salad, you can put beef on a salad, turkey, you can use beans, and then do some set of, sort of oil and vinegar dressing or a mixture of oil and vinegar with some herbs. Um, but it's really simple to make a salad. So if you keep, you know, fresh lettuce, then you can easily make up a salad that's good for you and tastes good. I want to remind you that omelets are <laughs> really good meals regardless of the time of day. So two eggs and then some cheese, meat, vegetables, add some seasonings like oregano or um, I personally like cumin and chili powder, just gives it a little spice. So it's easy to put together and it's something that you can have in the house and you can make with all those things I told you you should kind of keep in the house. Again, if you don't like any of these things or you want to get a little less protein or a little less something else, you can adjust them to not use, but the base of your item, the omelet is the eggs or the um, salad is the lettuce, is always the same. So then you add these other things, it makes a good meal. And a quick casserole. So in general, Casseroles are nice to make for groups of people or even just to eat over a few days. And you can use a nine by 13 inch dish and it takes one to one and a half protein, one, and a half, one to one and a half pounds of protein, uh, three to four cups cooked vegetables, two cups of starchy vegetables or grains, some liquid, a little bit of topping. You mix it together, you add the topping, you bake it 350 degrees for 30 to 45 minutes. If you wanna make these ahead, you can put them in a nine by 13 dish, mix them all up, and then put them, put a liner in the dish, put the casserole in the dish, freeze it, and then take it out of the dish and put that in a baggie. And then you have your dish to use, but then when you're ready to cook, it just fits right in the dish and you cook it in the oven. 
So I want to um, just kind of go over some other tips. Make sure you're understanding your prescriptions and how to take them either with meals before or after meals. If you have questions, call your doctor's offices. They're still there. They're still going to answer your questions. They're still going to call you back. Manage your related conditions as well as you can. Try to control your diabetes and your blood pressure. If um, doing certain things, I know Elizabeth's going to talk about reducing your stress, but sometimes your stress, reducing that can help lower your blood pressure, help control your blood sugar. Follow low to sodium diet. Don't use salt substitutes. Usually if it's a white sub salt substitute, it's potassium chloride, which is something you don't want to add a whole bunch of to your diet. Um, I want you to focus on eating a variety of foods. I see too many people severely restricting, cutting back the variety of foods and not eating enough calories. Maybe you're afraid of eating fat. You've heard fat is bad for you, but you can eat the healthy fats like olive oil and the avocados. Those are healthy fats. Those are good for you. Um, people not eating enough protein, either on dialysis, they're not getting enough because there's a larger amount they need to eat or they're worried pre-dialysis that they shouldn't eat protein. All of those, you need to know how much protein you should eat and then try to get to that amount. If you're eating more processed foods, which I hope you're doing a little better at home to cook the, um, to eat the uh, more home cooked meals, but processed foods are higher in sodium. So try to figure out if you can make those from scratch at home or make at least more of it from scratch. Common issues are trying to stick to a strict list of foods. That's what I was talking about, where you get that list from the nurse when you first get diagnosed, or you start trying to cut out all these foods and you're, you're sticking to the strict list of foods and it gets real boring real quick. So I want you to try to eat a variety of foods. Cooking at home is much healthier. You don't need to add salt when you're cooking. Try to add those herbs and other spices and vegetables. Use more spices. And then I wanna encourage you to get started to improve and don't try to change everything at first. Just try to change one or two little things and then move on from there. Maithia, thank you so much. It was a really great session. I appreciated your advice about managing renal diet during pandemic and also tips about simple renal-friendly recipes. I'm really looking forward to try some of those as 